So welcome to another episode of Structo's Meet the Writers. Uh, this is a short form video series where we talk to the poets and writers who have contributed work to Structo 20. Um, today, very happy to be talking to Daisy Basson. Hi, Daisy. Good morning. Um, so you, you've kindly agreed to read the poem you have in the new issue. So uh, in your own time. Uh, Shloshim for T8918. The day after, there's a downpour, torrential, with gouts of water, lightning almost red, like koi butting against the surface of an ornamental lake. Pathetic fallacy, too late, but you appreciate the effort. The roads running with rain, the sculpted greens of the golf course filling up like oases. Violence and its secession, the procession of your grief, at least today, when it is a cloud that covers the sun that becomes fog when it settles down over the bay flats. A veil for a sailboat listing right, the Esme at the mercy of tides, without a deep harbor. Rituals exist to help you manage. Stones weigh down the marker to keep it from flying up, away. You begin to think you should carry some in your pocket, doling them out like candies to quiet your cranky children. Not like Wolf's commitment to oblivion, waiting in, a departure from what became, at the last moment, unbearable. There are names for everything, the first moment, Aninut, Avalut later, but no name for being sisterless, though it's the state you find yourself in, as will your daughter. There is no woman left whose face is coined with your mother's strike outside your mirror. If you lean forward to kiss her, you'll be the one who has to wipe away the red mark. It's not worth it. People who understand send messages, a photograph of a bee, of honey in a jar, gold in gold sunlight, the satisfying confluence of neshama and comprehension. Thank you very much. So this is, uh, at least it comes across as an incredibly personal poem. Do you, it was, it was, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no I, finish your question. <laughs> yeah, do, do you find, do you use poetry as, as a way to record and process what's going on in your minds? I, I guess the short answer is yes. I mean, I don't, I, I started writing poetry actually when I was a young child. I don't really know another way to be. Um, I understand other people don't do this, but it's always how I have sort of experienced the world that everything around me and my own experience of it is sort of potentially poetry. And that's a way to sort of um, come to some resolution with things. Um, this poem was written uh, a couple summers ago, actually. <clears throat> we spent a uh, summer with, we were with friends and that was written for my friend as, a, you know, my experience of her mourning, but also as a gift to her, mm -hmm. um, a way to respond to, to the death of her mother, um, which actually, she was in that period of mourning while we were on vacation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to give her something um, that would be something that sort of transcended, you know, a service or, I mean, I think at the time I had also sent a bunch of pastries um, <laughs> because that's what you do. Um, yeah. But my response usually to people is to, to send a poem. I've written poems for um, birth of children, for weddings. I wrote a poem for my own wedding ceremony. Um, so I like to write them for these sort of more important events, but also just that's, that's life. So there's some lovely use of language in here. Um, and it's language that I'm, I'm not familiar with, or at least I wasn't before we, um, before we had the submission then. Can you tell me a little bit about some of the some of the perhaps some of the more unusual words in here? The the italicized words. So those are, um, I think, mostly the words that refer to periods of Jewish mourning. So the title um, is the. So I think some people may be familiar with the with the term of sitting shiva, right? That's the one that sort of made it out into the world most, which is like that seven day period around the time of of the death. Um, but actually, it's incredibly detailed. Um, and so there's a 30 day period, which is what the title refers to. Um, and then the first day of mourning is called um, Aninut. And then the longer period is also called Avalut. And then there's a bunch of other yeah. um, time periods in there as well. Um, and the Shama, which I didn't italicize is actually the Hebrew word for the soul. Um, so I actually, my, my family is Jewish, but I grew up not really being raised as, as a practicing Jew. Um, so I have this sort of liminal, uh, experience of being Jewish, yeah. um, draw from it sort of creatively. And it's, it's uh, a familial thing, but it's not necessarily a spiritual aspect of, of my life outside of the creative part. 
Sure. So that was actually going to be my question because I, I went down a, a, I don't know, 30 minute rabbit hole after reading the submission, deciding that it was clearly one we wanted to take of basically reading about uh, uh, death in Judaism, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. And my, my question is, yeah, wh why did you choose not to, it, it typically uh, italicizing words that are in a different language than the, the main text is done uh, to point out their foreignness. And yet you didn't do that with all of the words there. So was, was that, uh, what, was, what was the thought behind that? Um, I think to me, the, the one that I didn't italicize is neshama, the word yeah. for the soul. And I think really that comes down to my feeling of that word is not foreign to me. Like when I, when I read that word, that word felt mm -hmm. like a word that I spoke, even though I didn't go to, like, I didn't go to Hebrew school. I don't speak Hebrew. I didn't get bat mitzvah, but that word resonates for me. Whereas the other ones feel more different. Um, the yeah. other piece is that I have not lost my mother. I have not gone through that experience. Right. Um, so there's that distance. So that, her, that morning is not mine in the same way. Um, I didn't italicize the title because I always feel like it's a little funky when you italicize the title, like it's already the title. So that one is sort of like, sure. I always find that very interesting in books when um, I'm just now curious to see what we did in the, in our, in our book. Um, but when, when words that are not in the primary language are italicized or not, I always think that's very much a statement of intent by either the publisher or the author or in extreme cases, the typesetter, um, because it's very much a, uh, yeah, it, it's a distancing of like, like you say, but it can also be a, yeah, it's a tool perhaps for showing the attitude of, of the narrator in a piece of fiction sometimes, or, you know, I always find that incredibly interesting to see which the choices that are made there, because it can be quite, it can be sub subliminal sometimes, but yeah, it, when you notice it, it's like, oh, that's interesting. They're not, they're not italicizing these words. Anyway, I find that, I find that really interesting. Um, so you're, you're currently, where, where, where are you currently based? You're in, in the U.S., but in... I'm in the U.S., I'm on the East Coast. I am in Rhode Island, which is basically the state that's used as a unit of measurement to indicate smallness. <laughs> Even though we actually have the same population as several other states, including Wyoming, which is a pretty big place. Um, but we're the smallest, the smallest state, so that's generally, when people talk about Rhode Island, people will be like, and you can cross all of Rhode Island in half an hour. Um, so we're on the East Coast. Um, so I would say for other people in the world, um, we are between Boston and New York City. Okay, good. So I, I suspect that isn't the first time you said the Wyoming fact. <laughs> well, the other funny thing about Rhode Island is that there actually is a city in Rhode Island or town named Wyoming. So there's a Wyoming in Rhode Island, but there's not a Rhode Island in Wyoming. I love it. The first time I went there, I was like, what? There's a, we're in Wyoming now? It's just, and they're very, they're very different places. Um, mm -hmm. Rhode Island is sort of compact. Wyoming is not. <laughs> so in your, in your bio um, uh, in the new issue and, uh, and, and elsewhere with your writing, there is, there's one, you know, it says you're a writer and a, uh, you're also a, a novelist, which we'll talk about. But it's also the slightly more unusual job for a, a, a poet of your level, which is that you're also a, a physician. Yes. Um, so that's that's probably something that people might go okay how, how do you have time to do this <laughs> uh, i guess i would say how do i have time not to do this although i will admit that um i wrote a lot of poetry when i was growing up and i was an english major at college and i um my thesis was a book of poetry and then i went to medical school and the pace of the uh writing of poetry dropped mm -hmm. um so i wrote some poetry during medical school less during my uh the rest of my training which also coincided with me um, having children. And then sort of, I sort of came out of it after a while. And then as my uh, youngest child got a bit older, um, I started writing more. So, I mean, I guess the, the beauty of writing poetry is there are small found moments in every day. Um, and I will, I will say, cause I know a lot of writers will say they get up really early. Um, they get up at 5 a.m. So they have that hour of quiet to write. I do not do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's reassuring to hear. I do not get up super early. I'm impressed when people do, and that's great more power to them. I don't get up very early to write. Um, I have arranged my schedule that um, on Fridays, I don't see patients. 
So, you know, prior to the pandemic, um, I was home alone on Fridays and that was the day that I could get a lot of writing done. Now, um, my children and my husband and I have been all in our house since March. Um, so I've had to be a bit more creative about how and when I find the time to write. Um, but there's, there's sort of spots I find. Um, and sometimes I'm in the mood and other times I'm not. And so that sort of comes and, and goes. Um, so I will say I can't write very much at night. I right. get tired at a certain point, and then I'm like, then I might want to write. I, I complain about this a lot. I want to write, but I can tell, like, there's nothing there. Uh, can you even take notes, or is that all just sticking around until the next morning? No, I might, I might put some notes down and keep yeah. some ideas. Um, I'm actually doing that with, I think we're going to talk about the Tupelo project, but I have right. a list of, of notes for Tupelo. Um, and for novels, I will do that. Um, so can you explain Tupelo, the Tupelo 3030 project for people who so, aren't aware of it? Okay, so the Tupelo 3030 project is that uh, a group of seven to, I guess, maybe nine or 10 poets uh, sign up for the zany idea of writing 30 poems in 30 days. Um, and while they're not super strict about making sure you write the exact poem on the exact day, you really are supposed to be writing them during that month that you're doing them. Um, and I know for sure that you're allowed to have a little bit of a buffer because I, we've got this, the A-OK -okay <laughs> from, from the person who runs it. Um, so there's a group of you and you're, you're writing poems and you have to have them written and you submit them and then and you have to like let them go, um, which is actually pretty different for me. I usually write poems and let them sit. Mm -hmm. When I was much younger, I would put them in a drawer and close the drawer and then come back to them maybe weeks or months later to look at them. With this, you got to write the poem and then, I mean, I've built in a little bit of time, maybe an extra day for myself to come back and look at it. But at a certain point, you say like, that, that's where it is right now. You're off in the world. Um, which is sort of daunting, but also freeing in a way. You can't suffer over them very much. They're out. And then the next day there's a new one. So it's a constant chance to, to, you know, move on. Yeah, that was going to be my question, actually. How are you finding the, a lot of writers I know, uh, they, they publish writing when it's ripped out of their hands, possibly physically. Um, how, how, are you, how have you found that? Um, I would say the first week I was having some trouble with it. And then I had this sort of thought like this, I just have to let them go. They have to be, however good they are at the moment, that has to be good enough, um, which honestly is kind of a thing I would probably say to someone in therapy. Um, like that's, that's where it is right now and that's okay. Right. We'll say that um, because it's this sort of like do 30 poems in 30 days and I'm, I'm sharing them on my um, Facebook page. I'm for a lot of people who are not writers. So most of my followers are my friends and family. Um, so I'm trying to write some different forms and then mm. put sort of an educational slant on like, this is what a golden shovel is. This is what a, you know, trile is or whatever. Um, so nice. that yeah. helped a little bit because I feel like, well, even if it's not the best golden shovel, it's a golden shovel. And so people who've never read one before will now be introduced to this form and that's kind of neat. Yeah. It's a really great project. And actually, uh, one of our editors, Matthew Landrum, uh, has done it, I think, a couple of times. Uh, yeah. And he, yeah, he, I think he has had a similar experience and I think uses it partially for that. Uh, yeah, yeah a, a, feeling, a feeling of having it taken away from you, which I think he needs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, in, in, in an interest of keeping this short and then you get back on to writing your, your poems, um, <laughs> you're, so you're in the middle of the 3030 project, which answers my question, what are you working on right now? Um, but also you have, uh, you're, a, you're a novelist and you have a book which is currently circulating, presumably publishing offices and so on. Oh, it's in that, in that lovely in-between state that we all love. Yeah. Out on sub in it's sort of like another world. Um, so I wrote a novel, gosh, this was I think in 2016. Um, and I'm a doctor, so I wrote a novel about a doctor. Um, but I will say I'm a psychiatrist and I wrote about a surgeon. Um, whose best friend is a psychiatrist. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, got, I, have to get, yeah. I have to get my field in there. Um, so I wrote that and then um, and I managed to find an agent. The time it took me to find an agent, I wrote a second book um, thinking, well, you know, this is not going so well. Maybe I need to try to find something more marketable. <laughs> um, so I wrote a second book that I enjoyed writing that I thought would be perhaps more marketable. Um, and I got the agent. And then now I'm sort of waiting on the first book. So I started a third book. <laughs> Feeling like, okay, well, you know, you might as well keep going. Um, and this third book is um, kind of the most ambitious of the three in that it's a, there's a book within a book concept mm -hmm. going on. So the, the main character has discovered a manuscript that she's reading. Um, and so, you know, I'm on a chapter where I'm sort of alternating between those, those two parts. And I, have, I would say the Tupelo project has pretty much taken up all the creative bandwidth. I was like, I can't, 
I can't work on this book, the, the <laughs> double book, while I'm also writing the poems every day. But I leave the tabs open. Like they're there. Like I'm going to get back. I'm going to get back to you. I haven't forgotten about you. You're still there. Um, and then I look there and then my eyes sort of like shift away. Like, can't do it. <laughs> yeah. um, but I have, and I actually have all my notes for that book also open. So like in case I would have a brilliant idea, I can just tap it down really quickly. Um, and then be like, that's just going to have to sit. But that's been another part of this month for me is um, saying like, look, you cannot write the novel and do 30 poems in 30 days and and also I, honestly i don't think i could do it even if i wasn't seeing patients um right. and i see i'm seeing all my patients remotely so i'm i'm in my house i'm you know like i'm your doctor in the basement now it sort of feels like a troll <laughs> under the bridge <laughs> but, but no one's unhappy because everyone's safe um so that's been sort of a that's been sort of a coming to terms with i'm just not gonna be able to work on the novel which i, I sort of miss but then it's sort of like it's waiting for me uh, when i'm yeah. done with this i'll get back to it and maybe i'm hoping that I will have some more brilliant ideas that were stirred up by all the poetry. Yeah, or, or it'll be you're be encouraged and, and, and yeah engaged to go back to a different kind of writing post. Yes. Yeah. Well, brilliant. Thanks again for taking the time. It's been it's been lovely to oh, chat. Pleasure. And uh, yeah, uh, people can read that uh, your poem, which is in Instructor Twenty. Thanks so much. Thank